but this morning we will uh, be focused on uh, specific effects to species and uh, Richard Feely will, will start that off on uh, the issue of ocean acidification and its effects to um, species and ecosystems. Uh, Richard is a supervisory oceanographer for NOAA at the Pacific uh, Marine Environmental Laboratory. His research interests include chemical ocean oceanography and uh, aquatic chemistry, uh, specifically the mechanisms controlling sources and sinks of man-made CO2 in the oceans and the impacts of hydrothermal processes on uh, the chemistry of the oceans. Richard is responsible for the development of chemical oceanographic research studies for several of NOAA's national research programs, and he's also responsible for directing the, the development of analytical procedures for the analysis of CO2 in seawater. Richard is a widely, widely published author, and he sits on na nine national and international committees and panels, and I won't list them here, uh, on on ocean, oceanography and climate change. And he holds uh, many awards, including being co-awarded for the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with other IPCC authors. So please uh, join me in welcoming Richard. Come on up. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, David, and uh, thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Geological Survey for inviting me to be here. I'm the uh, other kid in the block talking about the other CO2 pro problem, that is ocean acidification. And when I start these talks, I always first present this first slide. Most of you know automatically what it is. It's probably the most well-known slide in the world on the carbon system. It's the Mauna Loa record from Dave Keeling, who started his work in 1957 and continued it out through 2007, showing the increase in atmospheric CO2. And what I've superimposed on that slide is the corresponding Hawaiian Ocean Time Series site uh, at the Aloha site just to north of Oahu, and the, and the dark blue color is the uh, PCO2, the concentration of CO2 in surface seawater, and the cyan color is the pH. And for measurements like this throughout the world, we know for certain that the CO2 in the oceans is increasing at a rate that's commensurate with the atmospheric increase, and the pH is decreasing on the order of 0.02 pH units per decade. So we have data throughout the world at many, many stations that uh, allow us to ascertain that this is a very consistent pattern throughout the world. And we know quite well that the ocean uptake of this anthropogenic CO2. So what I will talk about today is what is ocean acidification, what is the extent of ocean acidification, and some of the impacts on our marine ecosystems. Now, if we look at the IPCC models and their, their predictions of what has been happening, we know that from land use changes, we have released about 160 billion metric tons of carbon into the atmosphere. And in addition to that, through fossil CO2 burning, we released another 348 billion metric tons of carbon into the atmosphere. And most of that is resides in the atmosphere, about 234 uh, billion metric tons, or about 46%. The terrestrial sink is about 147 uh, petagrams of carbon, and the oceanic uptake is about 127. Uh, this is through the year 2000. And, and we have thought over the uh, last several decades that the ocean uptake of CO2 was a good thing because it reduces the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere by about 70 parts per million and cause an overall cooling uh, of the atmosphere by about a uh, half a degree C or so. But what we're now finding that th this uptake of this amount of carbon in the ocean is having a very serious and deleterious impact on our ocean ecosystems. Here is a, an example of what we uh, have for our atmospheric network throughout the world. 
This is run by NOAA's Earth Research Systems Laboratory. And we can see from the number of measurements that we have, starting from the South Pole uh, all the way to the North Pole, we can actually see the breathing of the world, the uptake of CO2 in the summertime and its release due to respiration in the wintertime. But you can see just from this small 10-year record, the gradual increase in the world baseline for CO2 increasing now at a rate which is unprecedented of two parts per million per year. If you take the IPC uh, scenarios for CO2 emissions out through the rest of this century, and I've shown here a number of different emission scenarios, you can see that if we want to uh, sustain CO2 at about 450 parts per million in the atmosphere, we need to begin to reduce CO2 emissions right away, very dramatically. If we want to sustain CO2 emissions at 550 parts per million, we need to begin with the next few, few years to begin to reduce CO2 emissions. Whatever we decide is the sustainable level of CO2 in the atmosphere, we should note that the change in the CO2 in the oceans will be with us for many hundreds of years to thousands of years. It's because of the slow turnaround in the oceans and the very slow change in the chemistry that takes place. And for pH, for example, that means that we are developing a new baseline of what the background pH levels that we will have to deal with for the next several centuries. And this ranges anywhere from 0.1 to 0.5 pH changes that we will be dealing with, depending on what sustainable level of CO2 we choose to approach. So how does CO2, ocean acidification work? CO2 reacts with seawater. Uh, it exchanges across the air-sea interface and reacts with water. That reaction is very, very fast. It forms carbonic acid. Carbonic is a weak acid which immediately dissociates to form a hydrogen ion. That hydrogen ion is what gives us our acidity. That hydrogen ion immediately reacts with a carbonate ion in seawater, consuming the carbonate and producing bicarbonate. It's the carbonate species that is very important for the formation of all the skeletons and shells of our carbonate forming organisms in sea. And you can see here an example, the white cliffs of Dover on the bottom picture is just full, full of coccolithophores, which are plant materials that form these calcium carbonate shells. So the base of this food chain is directly affected. If we look over time, we see that the pH of seawater has dropped on average from 8.2 to 8.1 since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Carbonate ion concentration has already dropped 16%. If we project the IPC scenarios out to the end of the century, we would see a pH drop of another 0.3 or 0.4 pH units down to about 7.8. This would be a 150 to 200% increase in the acidity of the oceans because of the addition of anthropogenic CO2 and the carbonate ion concentration would drop to about 50% of what it is per day. So you can see that the organisms that produce their calcium carbonate shells will have a more difficult time to do so. Now the organisms themselves are concerned about the saturation state of seawater and in order for them to produce their shells they have to have a high saturation state, generally around six for calcite or four for aragonite, and this is very important for them to have a high saturation state to produce their shells. If the, uh, the saturation state is a function of the calcium concentration times the carbonate concentration divided by this apparent solubility product. This apparent solubility product increases with decreasing temperature and increasing pressure, so that in the cold waters of the deep ocean, the apparent solubility product is high and the saturation state is low. This is why we have dissolution of calcium carbonate in the deep ocean. In the surface warm waters, the saturation state is high, and as I said, generally between four and six. Now, as we approach a equilibrium value of one, what we see is slow down as a calcification process, and below one, a dissolution begins to occur, even while the organism is still alive, in some cases.